Open your Bibles to, uh, I'm going to do a, a couple of PowerPoints, but just let me clean up a couple of issues from session that we just finished. Open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, or maybe verses 1 through 7. It's the story of uh, Elisha and the widow's oil. Because I know that a lot of uh, teaching has gone out about the miraculous uh, provision that God will sometimes give to us. And I'm talking to you about the fact that God's normal process is through business. So let's read this story here. You're all, you're all familiar with this story. Second Kings chapter 4, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha saying, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. By the way, that will give you an idea of the power of debt. She was in debt, and they said the creditors are going to take my two boys because I couldn't pay my debt. I mean, if, if you're ever under conviction about getting out of debt, this would be a good one to get you at the place where you say, I don't want to live in debt, amen? Because debt can have a control over you that's really powerful. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? I mean, she says, hey, I got a financial problem. Man of God, help me. And he says, what can I do? Tell me, what, what do you have in your house? So he takes her right back, not to what he can do, but to what she has. And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. So he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. Now, the, the message of this, of course, is the miraculous provision that God gave to her. And that's true. But I want to show you that the miraculous provision that God gave to her was dependent upon her work. In other words, she wouldn't have got the oil in the supply that she got except that she and her boys put the cart on the donkey and went to every neighbor. Hey, you go north, I'll go south. You go east, we'll go west. Let's gather all the vessels that we can, big ones, heavy ones, so heavy that it takes two of us to carry. There was work involved in the miraculous provision for her supply. So I know that whenever we get into the thing, we say, well, you know, God's going to provide for me miraculously. Praise God. Hallelujah. He's done it for me. I know he can do it for you. Except that he, even in his own stories, includes work as a part of the process through which it's done. So it says, verse 5, so she went from him, shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her. She poured it out, and it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there's not another vessel. So the oil ceased. She came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell your oil and pay your debt. It was a business transaction that she was asked to enter into as a part of that which got her out of the debt situation. Amen? All right, so we're talking this morning about trying to be faithful in even the little things. And I was reminded of a couple of other potential illustrations besides my soap and shampoo. And, and maybe, you know, just ask the Lord if he's convicting you about making bogus copies of music CDs. Mm. I don't need to preach. Conviction hardly landed. So you preach till conviction comes, then you get out of the way. All I had to do was say it, and we already set the stage, so you know, you know what's going on here. It's just, come on, let's come on up a step. You say, but I can't afford to buy it. Well, then, I guess you don't get to listen. You say, yeah, but it's so easy to just, now, if you get any of my tapes, my teaching tapes, you're free to copy them, give them away. You can go to my website, which is GodIsWorking.com, and you can download all my PowerPoint presentations. You're free to use them. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, you can edit my name off the front page and put your name on if you want to. I give you permission so you're not stealing it. I'm giving it to you. because. 
this is a, a part of what the Lord has spoken to me is give it away. Now, I can't give my book away because a publisher published it and uh, they charge me to buy it from them, but I can sell it at whatever price I want to. But you know what? It just wouldn't be right for you to just run off copies of it in mass and give it away so that it didn't sell. It just wouldn't be right. Wouldn't be honest. And the same thing is true when you're doing it with somebody else's CDs. Amen? Okay, we're going to do this uh, strategic thinking for the anointed business and professional person because I want to deal a little bit with your mindset on a few of the separation issues that we still have. We got into this just briefly yesterday, but we'll, I want to settle on it a little bit more today. So let's just walk through this PowerPoint presentation and uh, talk to you about the most powerful force in the world. I've already read this to you. The most powerful force in the world today, I believe, is this hidden army. It's the army of people that, that God has ready to release out into the marketplace, business, government, education, this tremendous army of business, professional, and governmental leaders who are anointed by God, because the anointing, you remember, is for everything, and are ready to serve God in their own sphere of influence on a daily basis. Go to the next slide. We're just going to work through this real quickly. What is our purpose? I believe our purpose as kingdom people is to bring about change in the spiritual climate over the cities and nations in which we live. Now, I'm a local church guy, so I believe that we should have a growing church, but I don't think that's enough. You see, as a local church pastor, for 35 years, I had a growing church. Well, our church grew every year. Now, always bigger this year than last year, but at the end of the year, at the end of the 35 years, I found out my city had not changed. See, during the 35 years that I was a local church pastor, when I, when I first started pastoring, the statistics said that in America, one out of two marriages ended in divorce, but in couples that went to church together, one out of 50 ended in divorce. That was 35, 40 years ago. In other words, it was a no-brainer. Go to church together, your marriage has a much greater chance of succeeding. Two years ago, Promise Keepers came out with a video that said that in America, the divorce rate amongst church-going people is now higher than amongst non-church-going people. And I'm saying, what good does it do if the church gets larger every year, if we're not impacting marriages. I mean, so what if more people come to your church if their marriages are not making it? Marriage being a divine, God-instituted institution. I mean, if we haven't impacted marriage, so what if we had a growing church? <laughs> That's one of my so what statements. You know, people say, hey, we're doing this. I say, so what? The question isn't, did you do that? The question is, did your city change? Did the crime rate come down? Did the divorce rate come down? Did the rebellious kids come down? Did the drug addiction come down? Did holiness happen out in the, in the business community? Did, did we get all of our Enrons and Worldcoms out of the way so we're all honest in business now? That's really what we've got to do. Now, the church's role in that is to bring that about. So your role in a church is not to have a bigger church. That, that isn't why we're here. If you want to know how to grow a church, man, I could give you all the church growth principles. I've done this long enough. I could help you to make sure your church grows every year. But it's one of those so what things. So what if it grows? If it hasn't changed your city or even the people who are in your church. So that's, I believe our purpose is to bring about a change in the spiritual climate over the cities and nations in which we live. Now, I, because I'm a bit of a student of revivals, I like to read about the places where God has moved in the past. And one of my favorite revivals is one that happened in America, started in August of 1857 and lasted until about 1860 in its, in its real height and strength. On the other hand, it lasted for 103 years beyond that at its core level. Now, that was a prayer meeting that started in New York City, started by a businessman named Jeremiah Lanfear. Jeremiah Lanfear was a single 45-year-old businessman 
who got asked by his local congregation to help them reach the whole city of New York. 1857, New York had a population of 800,000 at the time. You know, there's several million there now. Not quite a million back in 1857. And in the whole U.S., there were 30 million people at that time. So he gets asked by his congregation to be our city missionary. He's a businessman. He prays a prayer, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said, start a prayer meeting. At his prayer meeting, the first day, nobody came, but a few people came at the very end of it. Nobody came the first half hour. Then four people showed. The next week, a few more and a few more. Till suddenly, just a couple of months into the prayer meetings, he was having thousands every week at his prayer meeting. It moved from, every, uh, from once a month to every week, from every week uh, to every day, and they started having 2,500 people at a prayer meeting in downtown New York City every noonday. And that prayer meeting spread across America, from New York down the East Coast and in Florida. It even went across the Midwest into places like Kalamazoo, Michigan, Omaha, Nebraska, all the way to San Francisco. All of that before airplanes, you know, even train. I mean, just, you're only getting across the country with a covered wagon at that time. But still, this thing spread to the point that one million people got saved as a direct result of that man's prayer, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's a lot of people in any revival, but in a revival in a city that had 800,000, a nation that had 30, 30 million, one million saved and one million backsliders came back to Jesus. So two million people were impacted out of 30 million. That's about 7% of the society. The total population of America was impacted by one man. Now the reason I'm telling you that story now is because during that period of time in New York City, the Christian community became so strong that she had in her hands, in the benevolent societies of the churches, more money for the poor than the federal government had. It was a hundred and, not quite 150 years ago. You say, well, that's a long time ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago, but on the other hand, 150 years in the whole scope of things is not that long. To think the church of the living God at that time, not a local church, but the church, had more funding for the poor than the government did. And I believe that God wants us as a church to care for the poor. I don't think it's the government's responsibility. And when government does it, they do it without the compassion that we would do it with. So it's just money, not care. And I, I really think that we're doing a disservice to our nation by allowing the nation to do what God called us as his people to do. So they were impacting their city. At that time, the Christians were impacting the nation with care for the poor. But at that same time, 1858, when immigrants would come from Europe to America, and most of the immigrants were still coming from Europe to America at that time, that was two years before the Civil War. Civil War came in like 1861. So this is a period of time just for the Civil War. The, the U.S. is still in formative, pretty rough stages. Immigrants landed in New York, and history tells you they got off the ship and came onto the dock, knelt down, and gave their heart to the Lord. Nobody preaching, no Salvation Army band playing, nobody handing out tracts. The spiritual climate in New York was so heavy that you came into the city and got saved. Now, there was a period here in Pensacola where the spiritual climate was so heavy that you come into the city, you could feel it. And I believe that's what God wants. That's his ultimate purpose for us, is to impact our city in such a way that just getting here. Now, most people will tell the story that, that when they got to the church, they felt the presence. Hallelujah. But my prayer, when they got to the city, they felt the presence. See, my prayer is that when they came into the city, how about when they come into our nation, that America becomes such a godly nation that just getting here gets you in the presence of Jesus. That, I think, is our ultimate aim. So my question to you is, is, is that possible? Is it possible? See, now, if it's possible 
for a church building to have the manifest presence of Jesus so present here that even after we leave, you can still feel it, which is true. You come into an empty building where God has been worshipped, you can feel something different. You've all been there. You don't always have to worship 30 minutes to get the presence of God. I mean, it's great to worship 30 minutes and get the presence. I love worship. But there are times when I walk in the place and feel the presence of God. Now, if that's possible in a church building, which isn't really the church, then that's possible in my home. So that means that in my home, I can establish God's presence so strongly that when people visit my home, they feel God. And my children are influenced through that presence. And if it's possible in my church building and in my home, then it's possible where I work. So if I can establish God's presence, and if it's possible where I work, then it's possible in every store in the chain that I work in. And if it's possible in that, then it means it's possible in my whole community. So you just got to stretch this a little bit from here to here to here to here till suddenly we have changed the spiritual climate over the cities and the nations in which we live. I say don't stop until you get there. I mean, set your goal so high that that's the ultimate goal. God, use me to change my city in such a way that coming into my city, Jesus' presence is so strong there because he promised if I be lifted up, I will draw, what did he say? All men to myself. I don't have to preach to everybody. I have to lift Jesus up to everybody. And if I get him lifted, then he will draw. So if I can lift Jesus up in my city, suddenly my city is the church. Now that's what I think our purpose is. And so I'm challenging students here at BRSM to get your vision higher. I mean, preach with everything that's in you soul wood with everything that's in you, worship with everything that's in you, evangelize with everything that's in you, but get your goal not just to have a growing church. I mean, that's a good thing, but it's not the ultimate thing. Make it to change your city. It doesn't matter what size your city is. It can be a little town. The first congregation that I was pastor of was in a town of 140 population, a church of 12. You want to talk about if you'll be faithful in the little things. <laughs> well, I tell you, when I started preaching, we had 12 people. My first contact was with a family that had seven kids. And I got that family, mom and dad, and seven kids is nine, and I'm 10. And we almost doubled the church in one week. Boom. You know, it's just like, you know, when you're, when you're real small, it doesn't take much to double. <laughs> so I want, but I want to impact my whole city, 140 people. Well, you only got 140 people in town. Anybody come from a small town? Yeah. I mean, go after the small town first. It's all right. Let's watch every small town of America get impacted by Jesus. And then we'll go after the cities. Because it doesn't matter what size it is, God just wants to catch them all. Yes. Secondly, I believe our purpose is to release, empower, and equip marketplace leaders. Church leaders, yes, that's why BRSM exists. Amen. We love the church. We want to produce missionaries, pastors, youth workers, evangelists. We want to touch it all. But that ain't all we want to do. Excuse me for the ain't. That ain't all we want to do. We want to release a few marketplace people as well. Let's go to the next slide. So even though we see pockets of revival, our na nations and cities remain virtually unchanged. Therefore, my conclusion is, if you get the same conclusion, the church as we know it must change the way it approaches ministry programs, equipping the saints. See, as a local church pastor, I realized I did very little equipping the saints for ministry in their workplace. I did a lot of equipping saints for ministry in my church program. I did very little equipping my congregation for their everyday work life where they spend 70% of their waking hours. 
If you're going to be a local church worker, you've got to think, I've got to train the congregation that spends most of their time <clears throat> out in their workplace. I've got to train them to, to be effective out there. What do they need to know? Well, they need to know how to share Jesus. <laughs> they got to know how to live a life of, of integrity. They got to know how to worship. And they got to know the same things they got to know if they're going to be a cell group leader in your local church or if they're going to work with your youth group. But you got to focus it in another way. So just change your attention. Because if we don't change the way we approach ministry programs, equipping the saints, and recognizing leadership, we're going to end up with the same results we've had for years. And lose the harvest. And, and I told you, see, I've done this long enough to know that it's not enough to just have a growing church. See, I've been involved in every size congregation there is. I had 12 in my first congregation. We have 10,000 attending now the church that I'm a part of. So I, I, I've been a, last uh, two weeks ago, I was in Indonesia, and I spoke on Sunday, and they said, uh, you're going to be speaking at three congregations today. This is Jakarta, Indonesia, the largest Muslim nation in the world. They said, you'll be speaking at three congregations today. One is a small church, about 200. One is uh, a church called Abba Love, and Abba Love Church has got services all over the city. There are several thousands, maybe 20,000. And then you're going to be speaking at Bethel Church of Indonesia. And I said, how big is that one? They said, well, that's the second largest church in the city. I said, really, how big is it? 150,000 members. Now, that church rents every Sunday the convention center in Jakarta for their Sunday services. And there's three rooms there at the convention center, and they never know which one they're going to get till Sunday morning when they get there. <laughs> How would you like that? Church is at the convention center, but we don't know which room. They have one that seats 14,000, one that seats five, and one that seats three. And they get one of those three buildings every week. They're guaranteed of that. But they don't know which one. So they, some days they fill it with 14,000. I spoke at their 4 o'clock Sunday afternoon service in their 5,000 seat auditorium, which was probably 80% full. They've been having services all day. So I, I know about the local church. I know about what it's doing, but I also know we haven't yet reached Indonesia for Christ. Big church notwithstanding. So I'm saying we've got to change the way we do church, amen? And that means we've got to change our thinking. Let's go to the next slide. So how did we get here? What happened was we divided our lives and our thinking into two separate areas, spiritual and secular. And just be honest with me, because most of us operate with this split mindset that certain part of my life is spiritual and certain part is secular. Now, if we take that to the extreme, you can get in real trouble. The, 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 the biggest extreme it can be taken to was when I was counseling a woman. My wife and I were counseling a woman who had had an affair with her pastor. And we said to her, <laughs> finally in the counseling, how in the world? I mean, she was in the choir, so every Sunday she'd sit right behind him in the service. They had an affair, went on for a year. How in the world did you justify having an affair with a married man who was your pastor? And she said, here's what he told me. This is the ultimate spiritual secular thing. Here's what he told her. He said, you have to understand that as a man, I have two parts, my spiritual part and my fleshly part. And when you minister to my fleshly needs, you make me stronger in my spirit. So actually, by having this affair, I'm a better pastor. Yeah, that's sick. That's the farthest you can stretch that. But if you believe that you are spiritual and secular, you will excuse a part of your secular life. And you will not hold yourself to the same standard there that you hold yourself in your spiritual being. That's why some business people can come to church and promise honesty and go to work and lie and not even see the inconsistency because, they say, you got to understand it, that's just the secular world. If you don't cheat, you don't get ahead. 
If you don't lie, you don't make the sale. So it's a business thing. Business in that case being secular. I want to remind you of something, BRSM students. You do not have a secular part of your life. It does not exist. There is no such thing as a part of you that is not your spiritual being. There's no part of you that is not spiritual. And that's true with every member of God's kingdom. We're spirit beings. God said, you're going to worship me, you've got to worship me in spirit and truth. But it's out of this, this divided mindset. How many of you think you operate with a divided mindset in part of your life? How many of you think you've conquered that completely? I only saw a few hands on the, that you admitted to it, but I didn't see any hands on the part where you've conquered it, which means that all of us, therefore, are saying we still got a little bit of that in us. So how many of you think you operate with a little bit of the split mindset still? I mean, I, I'm going to prove to you in a moment that it's there. You might as well admit it to it right now so you can say, I knew that. I knew that in advance because I'm going to prove to you that we're still there. I don't want to be there. I'm trying to get out of that. I'm trying to break myself from that, but I know it's still a part of who I am. This spiritual, secular, split mind represent the different thinking between Hebrew worldview and Greek worldview. Now, I don't know if there, are we teaching some of this at uh, BRSM about the, the difference between the Hebrew worldview and the Greek worldview? Here's, here's the, the, just the, the essence of it is that the Hebrew mind, this is the, the mindset under which the Bible was written, did not divide the world into real and unreal or spiritual and secular. For the Hebrew mind, it was all one thing. For instance, to the Hebrew mind, both the seen and the unseen were the same. Had the same power, the same reality. How many of you believe in angels? How many of you have seen an angel? Yeah, there's a handful of students, praise God, that have seen an angel. Most of us haven't, but I still believe in angels. You know, I've seen the effect. I think I've heard an angel talk to me, but I've not seen an angel. But I know angels exist. To me, angels are as real as you are. See, I can see you, and I know you're real. I can't see angels, but I know angels are real. They're a part of my spiritual understanding, and that which I can't see is as real as that which I can. That was the Hebrew mindset. The Greek mindset, and it was put upon us by guys like Plato and Socrates, who began to separate the seen and the unseen. And they knock on wood, that's real, but this stuff up here, what they call the spiritual world, that was separate from and completely different from your real experience. So they separated the seen and the unseen into two separate parts of life. All right, now how many of you believe in demons? How many of you have seen a demon? Wow, more of you have seen demons than angels. Well, we've got to ask God to open our eyes. Because I know there's twice as many angels than there are demons. But what happens is we've seen, I've, I've not seen a demon, uh, but I've seen the impact of them. I have a friend who operates with an awesome discerning ministry. His ministry of discernment is at the highest level of anybody I'd ever, I've ever seen. And he doesn't see demons or angels, but he can feel them. He'll say, wow, there's an angel here. Oh, he's a big one. Yeah, he's right here. He's right there. He can feel it. He said, oh, there's a demon here. Ow, in the name of Jesus. Oh, good, now the demon's gone. Praise God, angel, thank you, stay here. He sees, I mean, he feels these things. And he always says, his wife tells him to quit saying this, but he always says, it's weird, but it works. <laughs> she says, it's not weird, it's normal. <laughs> It is normal that we would experience the reality of angels and that we would know how to get rid of the reality of demons. Now, my friend can also, he has the 
discerning ability to go back into your generation's past and find the source that the demonic presence came into your generation and break it off of you. Now, for me, it was migraine headaches that I had, migraine headaches, and I didn't have them often enough that my doctor was concerned. I would have a migraine headache about one a month and about two or three a year that would keep me completely debilitated for three days. When you get a migraine headache like that, you shut the lights off, you shut the sound off, you lay down, you don't eat, you don't talk, you don't go. It, it, occasionally it would happen to me on a Sunday. I couldn't go preach. I mean, but my doctor says, oh, you got to have more often before we're going to be real concerned. Well, I was concerned because they were too often. So I talked to my friend Paul. He said, well, let's find the source of those things. So he goes, he clicks into his discerning and finds in my generation past, six generations ago, a blow to the head of one of my ancestors that put headaches in. And when he broke that, my migraine headaches disappeared. And, and my daughter's, who wasn't even there, lost hers as well because they were a part of her generational line. So when it got broken off of me, it was broken off of her. So this discerning stuff is good. But it's, it's being able to operate in the unseen as well as the seen realm. When we, when we split our mind and separate those two and say, that's spiritual, that's secular, what we're usually saying, the real, that which I can touch and feel, that's my real. But the spiritual, angels and the presence of God and all these things, that's the spiritual, unreal part of my life. I want you to take that which we've oftentimes called unreal and make that more real and stop the separated thinking. Now let's watch this up here on the screen because I've got a little bit of definition help here. Here's a, a book by an Aussie named James Thwaites and a quote from his book is, for the Hebrew, the spiritual or unseen realm was one with the creative realm. It did not exist in a separate or removed dimension. It was in union with all of life and creation. The spiritual dimension of life is the heart or essence of every created thing, both seen and unseen. What we've called the spiritual realm was the Hebrew mind, just the unseen realm. It didn't matter if you could see it, it was still real. Now, most of us have moved there with relation to angels and demons, okay? Most of us are there now. You have a little trouble with my friend who can feel the angels and demons, but you get around him and you say, wow, it really works. He's a brilliant man. By the way, he's a Baptist uh, pastor. I might say he got in all kinds of trouble with his Baptist church with his gift of discernment because they didn't really receive with understanding his giftedness. <laughs> so his American Baptist church, uh, except for some of his American Baptist friends that were demonized and got set free, <laughs> were, were pretty grateful. <laughs> but now he operates a, a ministry called Aslan's Place. It's awesome. His name is Paul Cox, Dr. Paul Cox. If you get to run into Paul sometime, why... Uh, Tell him I said hello and then ask him to help you because it's what he does. He's just doing it. Okay, I'm trying to get you to think. Let's go to the next slide. Trying to think all one. The Greeks saw the spiritual realm disconnected from and separate to the material world. Most people today operate with the Greek worldview. Most people, including most of us, still operate separating spiritual from secular. Now, in this view, where we separate things, church and work don't mix, which is why many of us were raised with the idea that don't bring business into the church. God hates business in the church. He drove business money changers out of the church. He didn't want to have anything to do with it. So business and church don't mix. And when we take it to that level, I remember I was at a Christian company in San Jose, and we were talking, we were sitting around talking church in a business setting, and another guy came in and said, you people need to remember that you can't mix church and business. And we all looked at him like, what planet did you come from? And then we realized the same one we were on about six months before. Because we had just come to the place where we understood business and church. That it, it's just all a part of who I am. It's not a separate thing.
Most of us still are operating with a split mindset. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Let's go on through the rest of the slides. So just I'll run these questions by you. Have you ever used this phrase, come to church? Have you ever used that phrase? What did you mean? Come to the building. Now, in your mind, you know the building's not the church, that we're the church, but you still used it because you said, well, you know, I know the building's not the church, but that's the way we use it, so come to church. We're operating with a split mindset when we did that, folks. How about when you said, where do you go to church? Well, I don't go to church. I am the church. Now, where do you go to church? Well, I go to such and such church. My church is located on this corner, pastored by this pastor. We do these things. It meets at this time. That's where I go to church. Now, whenever we say that, the world who does not yet know Jesus believes that the church is a separate from their world thing. They believe church is a separate entity that you go to and you do things that they don't understand behind those doors and that they probably don't want to go there because they don't know what you're doing there. And besides that, you go there with a bunch of friends who aren't like them, so they see it as a split, separate thing. Now, I don't have an answer for this, folks, but I know we got a problem. As a pastor, we used to always say, find your place of service in our church. Now, we didn't really mean in our church. What we meant was we wanted you to serve our program. Where is your church located? How many people attend your church? How big is your church? I have fun with that one. People say to me, I'm, I'm pastoring my church. And, and our church grew every year until one year when the anointing of God hit and half of our people left. I don't know if anybody understands what I'm talking about, but I mean, when the anointing hit, a lot of our people loved it, and some of our people did not love it. They loved the order of an hour and 15-minute service, and when those services started going four hours, they didn't like that. They loved the order of everybody sitting. When people were laying all over the floor and weeping and slobbering on the carpet, and all, all of a sudden, they didn't like all of that. So one Sunday, this is a true story, one Sunday, we had 80 voice choir and a 20 piece orchestra. And the next Sunday, I didn't have a keyboard player. They all left, all in one movement. And they all went to another congregation. And that pastor over there told me, Rich, you just don't know how to handle, you don't know how to handle these people, and I do. And three months later, when they all left him, he came and repented to me and said, uh-oh, I know now about that strong-willed person. It was a woman at that particular case. So he said, I know about that strong-willed woman. Now, during that time, I was having more fun than ever before in ministry because God showed up. I, one couple, we had counseled a marriage for 12 years. Their marriage got healed in one night on the floor. They never needed counseling again. I tell you what, I, man, I wouldn't trade a growing church for that in any day. I mean, just watch it happen. Watching these kids hungry for God, watching 10-year-olds prophesy. I mean, I just, I was having so much fun. So people would say, so how's the church going? I said, oh, it's awesome. They say, you're growing, huh? I said, no, not really. We're about half the size we were. <laughs> because, you see, awesome means you're growing. But all of a sudden, I didn't care if we were growing or not because the church, to me, was no longer that group of people. So they say, how big is your church? I'd say, oh, it's growing. They say, praise God. No, not really. I had cheesecake last night, and it gained five pounds. I'll let that settle for me. See, I am the church. And if I'm the church... And I'm getting bigger. Okay, so, so are you with me? So they'd say, how's the church? I'd say, it's getting smaller. They'd say, that's too bad. No, it's really not. I'm on a diet. I'm doing it on purpose. It's just, see, I, because I'm the church. So I'm just playing with people. I'm having fun with this. I'm having more fun than any pastor deserves to have during that time in my life. Because I knew that we had tapped into the anointing of God. I didn't need a growing congregation for my self-esteem. 
come on, which I had needed for years before because my whole identity was wrapped up in being a pastor. And when my identity became wrapped up in being a pastor, my identity stopped being wrapped up in Jesus. And at that moment, I was in trouble. And I had to get beyond that. So I, I, quite honestly, I didn't care who showed up as long as three did. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's all we needed. I mean, if I can get those three to show up on Sunday, he hello, all the rest of you could either come or not. It ain't going to matter because we're going to have we're going to have fun today. You see, Tommy Tinney oftentimes says it's not how many people get in the church, but how much of the God or the church you get in the people. That's really what matters. It doesn't matter how many people you get in your building. It's how much of God you get in the people that are in the building. So with the split mindset, we talk about the church as a building or a place or a program. Now, you and I know that the church isn't the building. But what are we going to do with this thing called the church? That's why we're trying to use terminology I talked about yesterday, nuclear church and extended church. I, mean, I know we're stretching our limits to try to get communication skills out there, but I'm convinced that as long as the world believes we are a separate entity from them, that they're not going to want a part of what we have. Which is why I believe evangelism on the streets is more important than evangelism in the house. See, I, I believe worship in the streets is more important than worship in the house. I believe that living for Jesus at work is more important than living for Jesus at your church service. That's why I'm dealing with you on the little things. Because I don't think that we're really going to make an impact on our world until we get out there making an impact. And as long as we're just making an impact inside here, it's one of those so what things. I mean, so what? So what? Your church is bigger. So what? Did your city change? So what? You met the budget. So what? I want to know, did the city change? Did crime go down? Are rebellious kids coming to Jesus? Are marriages getting saved? Are the sick walking in healing? Are the poor walking in provision? That's the so what. All right. Let's go on to the next phrase. With the Greek mindset, the building equals the church. Membership equals the church. And with the Greek mindset, church is someplace you go instead of something that you are. You are the church. I got another quote from James Thwaites. I think he wrote this book called The Church Beyond the Congregation. Awesome book. Kind of a deep book. You got you to put your thinking cap on to read that book. But on the other hand, if you just get the title, you know what he's talking about. The church beyond the congregation. You know, usually we think of the church only as it gathers in congregational form. He's talking about the church spread. So let's go to the next slide. I think maybe, I'm not, I don't have my PowerPoint rec. Okay, here's, I don't have it memorized. We'll read his quote in a minute. Here's another, other phrases that might be better. Instead of where do you go to church, how about go into the world? Instead of finding your place of ministry here, how about you are in full-time ministry? Instead of come to church, how about be the church? Find ministry where you are. Serve God 24-7. Get involved in your own sphere of influence. That's what we need to do. Get involved in your own sphere of influence. Wherever God gives you influence, that's where you need to operate. Starts in your home, starts in your neighborhood, starts where you work. If we can't be effective at home, neighborhood, and work, I mean, if your neighbors don't know that you're standing for Jesus, it's not a whole lot of good for you to go down on the beach and witness to people you've never met. Yeah, I mean, okay, you know what I'm talking about. We've got to be effective in our influence areas. So become members of the Chamber of Commerce in your city. As a pastor, that'll be a member of the Chamber of Commerce. As a business person, I'll be a member of the Chamber of Commerce. Okay, let's go on. I'm just getting in. Here's, here's Jim's quote. The church is not something separate from marriage, family, and work. Indeed, the church is the people of God living and, and impacting, 
in and through all of creation. God did not create a special separate thing and call it the church. He created a body, the head of which is Christ, which would encompass and become the completion of created order. When God created the church, he made it a body. He said, I'm the head, you're the body. You're like members of the body. He didn't make an entity that sat in a group congregational-wise and said, that's the church. He created his body. He's the head. We're the body. Our problem is that we're too body-focused in the church. When most people talk about your church, they're talking about the body aspect of the church. See, what happened when the anointing hit our local congregation is we got our focus off the body and our focus on the Lord. So it no longer mattered how many people came. It didn't really matter because we weren't focusing on the number of people there. We were focusing on the Lord. So we'd get into worship, and we just worship Him. And it wasn't a matter of have we worshiped long enough to get to the real thing. <laughs> Come on, your pastor's going to say that to you someday if you're a worship leader. Okay, you worship till all the people get here. Then I'll preach. We realized that there were many times we didn't need to preach. In fact, we just as often as not wouldn't preach during that time. We just get in the presence of God. That happened this morning, didn't it? Just kind of get in the presence of God and we just stayed there. Just at that point, it doesn't really matter what the schedule is. What we're doing in God's presence is more important than anything else. Now, that's the church. And that's what, that's what Jesus created. Let's go on to the next slide. I don't have time to go into this, but the all things of Scripture is an interesting study. We were on it in, a, in 1 John 2, 27, where it says there's an anointing for all things. We were on it when we were reading about Abraham this morning, that God promised to bless him in all things. All things study is an interesting study. You can have fun with this thing. If you've got to write a paper for one of your classes, write it on all things. You study all the places in the Bible that talks about all things. Here's a few of them. In Ephesians 4.15, it says, grow up into all things. Mark 9 says, Elijah restores all things. You know, Elijah, in the, at the end of uh, Malachi, it says that Elijah is going to restore the hearts of the fathers to their sons and the sons of the fathers. That's a restoration that's going to happen here in these days. In Acts, it says that Jesus can't return until the restoration of all things. That's why I know Jesus is going to return when we get our all things together. The parents and kids are back together. Our mindset about work is back in place. A lot of the things that are out of place, when those all come back into place, Jesus will be ready to return. All the people that need to know him are going to meet him. And so I love to study the all things of Scripture. But one of them is interesting in Romans 8. We were talking about Romans 8 yesterday. Remember, the creation has got an expectation and it's groaning. You go on through there, it says, for we know that all things, what's it say? For we know that all things work. The word work there is the same word that would be used if you went to work, your job, work. All things work together for those who, what? What's it say? Who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. God threw work in there. And I, I'm not fully sure that I understand the complete context of that verse, but we've always applied it that all things work, meaning God makes them work on my behalf. But I think because of the use of the word there, that it may mean that when I work, all things come together. I just think that, that that whole mindset of work and God's purpose for my life are all in the same place. Okay, let's go to the next screen. I think I'm going to have you stand up right now. There's a little point in having, just go ahead and stand up. There's a little point in having strong congregations if marriages are falling apart all around us. It doesn't matter... If our worship service is contemporary, if people have no strength or time to nurture their own families, so what if the preaching is good, funny, or brief, if the day-to-day -day work of the saints is ineffective? The real battle and place of standing in life and in the heavenly realms is in marriage, in family, and in work. Now let's go to the next slide. 
And I want you to just read this scripture with me. There's about five slides, so uh, whoever's running the slides, just keep them flowing, because we're going to read these out loud right now as a declaration. Can you see it all there? It's almost, it's all right. Okay, let's, let's read it together. What joy for the nation whose God is the Lord, whose people he has chosen for his own. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees the whole human race. From his throne he observes all who live on the earth. He has made their hearts so he understands everything they do. The best equipped army cannot save a king, nor is great strength enough to save a warrior. Don't count on your war horse to give you victory. For all its strength, it cannot save you. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in times of famine. We depend on the Lord alone to save us. Only he can help us, protecting us like a shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we are trusting in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Read that last verse again. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Now the last phrase. For our hope is in you alone. Come on, what's conviction now? For our hope is in you alone. I'm not going to trust anything, Lord, but you, for our hope is in you alone. Father, this morning we declare again, you are the source of everything. Everything we have, you have given to us. And we thank you, Lord, that it's all come from you. Nothing that we have has any other source. So I'm going to seek you because my hope, my hope, my hope is in you. My hope is in you. My hope is in you alone. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. All right, go ahead and be seated. I'm going to quickly go through my last... Uh, I've got seven other PowerPoints, but the last one I'm going to do with this session, the last one this morning, and I'm going to do my best to let you out early again today. You know that your time to be out is 1 o'clock, and you've already signed the attendance sheet, <laughs> so you're getting credit all the way through. Wow, so if I let you out, it's just like bonus time. It's like God who gives you a bonus every once in a while. So I'm going to do my best. Let's go to the other uh, PowerPoint, the one that's called The Purpose for the Anointing. While we're going to that, I want you to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And I'm going to hurry through a part of this. In Genesis 1, verse 2, I was sitting in a meeting, and the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to read Genesis and Exodus, at which point I uh, argued with God. Just go ahead and go to the, the first screen of this thing. I started arguing with God and said, Lord, I've already read Genesis and Exodus. Does God ever speak to you? When, like when somebody's preaching or somebody's teaching is, uh, and you get your mind off on what God is saying instead of what you're hearing? Is that happening to any of you right now? <laughs> I mean, if it was really happening to you, you wouldn't have heard me say that, see? If your mind was totally there. But this is what happened to me. So the Lord is talking to me about read Genesis and Exodus. Now, I already know that when something is mentioned in the Bible for the first time, that's called the law of first mention. When it's mentioned in the Bible for the first time, you want to pay close and special attention because God is establishing foundation. So you're studying your Bible, you see something, where's this first mention? You, you read it, you say, what, where else is this in the Bible? You start doing a research back. You want to go right back to the first time God talks about that. So I'm looking for the Holy Spirit. That's what he told me. Find my Holy Spirit in Genesis 1 and 2, or in, in Exodus, Genesis and Exodus. Now, I found the Holy Spirit in Genesis 1, verse 2, where it says... The earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the earth. And then it says, and the Spirit of God hovered over the water. So the first time Holy Spirit shows up in the Bible is in verse 2. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Did you know that? The Holy Spirit is there at the beginning. Now, it says the Holy Spirit is hovering at that moment over that which has not yet been created, hovering over darkness 
emptiness, literally hovering over nothing, because nothing had yet been formed. And it says the Holy Spirit was hovering. You know what hovering means? Hovering is like a helicopter. There's wind action, but it could just stay in one, or a hub, hummingbird, or a hovercraft. Hovercraft, the technology of hovercraft is that the wind blows the, the craft off the water enough that then the wind can go, blow down on the water and move it. So hovering is wind action with something that can either stay in place or move. It says the Holy Spirit was hovering over what? Water, at that point, dark, empty, uncreated. Because the next verse says, and God said, let there be, and everything was created. Let there be light, and all the creation came forth. Now, I share that with you just to say, as a word of encouragement to some students, and especially to some of you who say, why do I need to sit through all this business stuff for two whole days? I'm not going into business. I don't want to go into business. I could care less about business. I don't have any business ideas. I have no creativity. Why am I here? Well, maybe it's because the Holy Spirit wants to hover over your nothingness. <laughs> See, if you say, I have no creative ideas, God says, oh, good. I like it when you don't have any because I have a lot. Uh, and God likes it when you say, Lord, I have nothing to offer you. I was talking to the Lord one afternoon because he kept waking me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Lord would wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm tired at 3 in the morning. I'm groggy. Can't even shake myself awake. So one afternoon I said, Lord, you know, I'm much more alert in the afternoon. I'm, I, I'm much sharper. In fact, Lord, if you would talk to me in the afternoon, I have much more to offer you. He said, that's why I talk to you at 3 in the morning. Because <laughs> I don't really care what you have to offer me. <laughs> I only care what I have to offer you. So I wake you up when you're in a groggy, sleep-induced stupor so that I can speak what I want to speak to you when you won't argue with me. So now, when God wakes me up at 3 in the morning, I say, yes, sir. I'm listening. What do you have in mind? I won't argue. Now, I think maybe the Holy Spirit's hovering over some of you today, especially some of you who are saying, I don't belong here. This is a wasted time for me. I have nothing. I'm not going to get anything from this. Oh, man. Holy Spirit says, oh, good. I'm going to hover over you. So would you just let him hover over you for a minute? Just kind of do the Holy Spirit hovering over you. Holy Spirit, fill my emptiness. Fill my, fill my uncreative mind. <laughs> Some of you feel that way when you walk into your class. You say, oh, man, I don't understand this stuff. It's way beyond me. The Holy Spirit says, oh, good. I like it when you get to the place where it's way beyond you. Because at that moment, you'll trust me. You won't trust in your own knowledge and ability. So that's where I got looking for the Holy Spirit. Then I went on. I found the Holy Spirit in Genesis chapter 41, verse 38, where it talks about Joseph. It says he's a man known. He's known as a man in whom is the Spirit of God. Joseph at that point was in prison. He was there falsely accused. He'd been forgotten, and he's being tortured. Now, he's in Remember, his brothers wanted to kill him. They were talked out of killing him, instead sold him into slavery. He went down to Egypt in Potiphar's house. He moved quickly to number two in the house, but then Potiphar's wife falsely accused him of endeavoring to, to rape her, and he got thrown into prison, innocent, in prison. While he was there, he interpreted a couple dreams, and the guy said, thank you, we'll remember you. Then they forgot him. So he's still there, doesn't belong there. Psalm 107 says that while he was there, they put iron fetters around his feet, which means they tighten him up every day, a little bit tighter, a little bit tighter, a little bit tighter. So he's living in a, in a constant state of pain brought on by torture. Falsely accused, forgotten, tortured, and it says, obviously, he's a man in whom is the Spirit of God. 
Now I get to that point, I say, Lord, I don't want the Spirit to just be in me when I'm flowing in my anointing. I want the Spirit to be in me on my most difficult moment. I want the Spirit to be in me when I'm falsely accused, when nobody understands, when I'm in pain, when I'm forgotten, when I'm alone. I still want the Holy Spirit to shine through me. Okay, now I read on. Let's go to the next slide. Exodus chapter 31. Just turn to this in your Bible because it's really a cool passage of Scripture. Exodus chapter 31 talks about uh, Bezalel. Was there one slide in between there? Did I, did I miss one? There should be one. Yeah, that one. The man is Bezalel. So here in Exodus chapter 31, we're talking about Bezalel. Exodus 31, his name means under the protection of God. Now it says here in verse 1 that Moses, that the Lord spoke to Moses. And by the way, when the Bible is written, it's just as normal as if you and I are talking to each other, and God spoke to Moses and said, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, and the son of, you got your Bible open, uh, the Ur, and uh, the tribe, and, and on and on. I mean, God just, just talks to Moses. And he says, See, I have called by name Bezalel which is really awesome to know, number one, that God knows your name. But not only does he know your name, I think in this case he gave him the name. When you read the word called, it literally means God put his sovereignty over it. When it says God saw the day and he, the, the light and he called it day, it means God put his sovereignty over it. When he saw the dark, he called it night, he put his sovereignty over it. When you see the word called in the Bible, when he calls someone, literally he's putting his hand of protection over them, and so he named him under the protection of God. And then he said to him, by the way, if you get a, get a little baby one of these days, you might want to think about his name. One who's under the protection of God. That'd be, that'd be a cool name to get, wouldn't it? Now, Bezalel doesn't really sound like a name you'd want to give to your baby, but, you know, naming Bezalel and calling Beezy and just, you know, just, Wow. Okay, I'm not really trying to convince you to name your baby Bezalel, but on the other hand, it's a cool name because it means under the protection of God. Now, most mom and dads today who are Christians are not into just naming their babies. They want to name their baby with a significant name. They want to they wanna know purpose and destiny on that name. So that most moms and dads who are really following Jesus are praying for the name, seeking God, give me the right name. Well, God chose, like he did with Abram to change, change his name, he chose this guy's name. Now, verse 3, if you got your Bible open, Exodus chapter 31, verse 3. See, I've chosen. And then it says, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God. The first reference in the Bible to being filled with the Spirit is right here. Most of us love to think about the filling of the Holy Ghost. We want the Holy Ghost to come and fill our lives. Holy Spirit, fill me. When we get somebody saved, we want to get them filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen? The first reference to being filled with the Holy Spirit is right here. Exodus chapter 31, verse 3. Now, I told you the law of first mention means whenever you study something, go back to where it started and see what God was doing at the beginning. There's a foundation here. So God filled him with the Spirit in wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and in all kinds of work, all manner of workmanship. When God filled the first man ever filled with the Spirit, it was with wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and work. Now, depending on your theological background, being filled with the Spirit can mean a number of different things. See, in some backgrounds that will be real familiar to you, being filled with the Spirit means it will be evidenced by speaking in tongues. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. In fact, you're not filled with the Spirit unless you speak in tongues. But this verse <laughs> says, I don't want to mess with your theology, I just want to get you thinking, okay? This verse says that the first time that God filled someone with the Spirit had, it, had nothing to do with speaking in tongues, prophesying, preaching, evangelizing, anything we put on had to do with work. So when I talk to you about there's an anointing for your work, I'm saying, in fact, God fills you with the Spirit for your work. God fills you with the Holy Spirit to enable you to work. 
Now, you've been hearing this from me enough that you know I really believe that work is a part of your destiny plan, that work is a part of God's transfer of wealth plan, that you, you can't really fulfill your purpose without work. The Bible says if you don't work, you shouldn't even eat. So, so, so when God first filled Bezalel with the Spirit, it was for work. Man, I have a hard time getting people excited about this, but I really think that you should get excited. I think that somebody should start saying, wow, that's interesting. I think I'm going to go get a few people in my job filled with the Spirit so they'll work. <laughs> Some of you who own businesses think, I, I, could, uh, I could use that prayer for some of my employees who never get there on time. Obviously, that's not Bible college students because we're under conviction to be people of integrity in even the little things like getting there on time. Huh. But we're going to be filled with the Spirit for our work. If you let God fill you with the Spirit fully, He's going to impact your work. If you really let the Spirit of God fill you, it will impact your work. Okay, now, I don't need the, the screen on the rest of this. Let's just, let's just talk about this because I, I don't want to go too long. Let me ask you, what do you know about Bezalel? How many of you have ever heard of Bezalel before? All right, that's cool. What do you know about Bezalel? What did he do that's of significance in the Bible? He built the... He built the tabernacle of the ark, the tabernacle and the ark of the covenant. Those two things he built. Now, God in Exodus 25 gave the design for the ark to Moses, but he gave the work to Bezalel. Some of you will operate like Moses getting the design. Some of you will operate like Bezalel building the ark. Some of you will operate hearing from God some of you will operate doing the things of God. Which is the higher call? Moses calling or Bezalel's calling? For Moses, his was the highest. For Bezalel, his was the highest. What's the highest calling? Getting the directions or doing the work? Neither one is higher than the other. It's not a higher call to be a pastor than it is to be a laborer. It's not. We've presented it that way in the church. I think sometimes pastors did it out of their own sense of insecurity around powerful business people, feeling a little insecure. So they presented it that way. But the reality is both calls are equally high and of importance because they're from God. So Moses gets the direction. Bezalel does the building. God fills Bezalel with the spirit to build the ark. What was the ark? What was the ark? The ark was the presence of God. The ark didn't symbolize the presence. The ark was the presence. In fact, God said, Exodus 25, you start in verse 10, read down about verse 20. Moses, here's the design for the ark. And then he says, you build it. And when you build it, I will meet with you there. You come to the ark, there you meet with me. Now, when God fills you with the Spirit, and it's for your work, he's filling you with the same intent that he did Bezalel. Why did he fill Bezalel with the Spirit? So that he could build the ark according to the specs, where God would dwell. Why does he fill you with the Spirit? So that you can build the ark to God's specifications where you work. All right, let's just make it real simple. Why do you go to work? To build the presence of God there. Man, this is real simple, isn't it? Why do you go to work? Just to bring the presence of God there. I've been saying this to you yesterday and today. I've been talking to you about it. If you lift up Jesus, he'll draw him into himself. You could change your whole city. You could just build the presence of God right there. Then when people get there, they get in God's presence, they get saved. So God says, I filled Bezalel with the Spirit for his work. I gave him creativity and design, working in jewels, working with wood, working with all kinds of crafts, so that he could build the ark 
all the time with the intent that we would get the idea that he'd fill me with the Spirit to let me go to work to build an ark there. Not one made out of wood and jewels and all that stuff, but a place where God's presence would dwell. Your purpose when you go to work is to bring the presence of God to that workplace. Therefore, it doesn't really matter where you work. God's presence needs to fill all the places. It doesn't matter that it's a Christian business or not. It matters that God's presence comes there. And your job is to establish the presence of God in that place. Two quick stories and I'm going to be done. Story number one, a man owns his own business. He's in the Philippines. His company has 2,000 employees. The name of the company is the Titanium Corporation. He's a non-Christian boss who got saved in 1991, 12 years ago, about right now. He got saved, led to the Lord by a woman who led him to Christ outside of a local church structure, led him to Jesus, and then said, I will now disciple you into the things of God. Now, his business, the Titanium Corporation, sounds like a real high-tech company of sorts, but what he really had, maybe you've heard me tell this story before, was 18 houses of prostitution and two hotels. All of them were operating in what would look like a hotel, but two of them were legitimately operating business hotels. The other 18 looked like hotels, but you went, when, you, when you rented the room there, you only got it for an hour and it came complete with a roommate. And he gets saved. And he's now a Christian. And this lady says, I'm going to disciple you in the things of God. Now, obviously, obviously, the first thing you do is shut down all 18 houses of prostitution, fire all the prostitutes, and they all go to work for other houses of prostitution. Obviously, that's what most of us would say. But this woman said, Mr. King, his name is Wooden King. Wooden, let's go after those one at a time. What I want you to do is hire a pastor and put him in that place. And so they went after house of prostitution number one. Slowly changed it from its mode of operation into a legitimately operating business hotel without, get this, without firing any of the girls and yet leading them to Jesus. When I met him, it was Thanksgiving of 1998. He came to Christ in 1991, so it's been a seven, eight-year project. He says, next month, December, I turn my last motel into a hotel. Motel in third world language. If you're in a third world country and you see a neon sign flashing motel, do not stop there with your family thinking you'll get a room. Here in Florida, you see a motel, go ahead. In the Philippines, in Argentina, in Brazil, other places, you don't do that. Because mostly those are houses of prostitution. He said, I turn, next month I turn my last motel into a hotel. Eight years, each of them now has a full-time pastor. In fact, his pastors in those hotels train the pastors of Manila in how to run cell groups. Because <laughs> they know how better than anybody else. They're running cell groups in the former house of prostitution. Now, did you get this? The girls stopped being prostitutes and got saved. And, but they still work for him, you know, front desk, restaurant, whatever it might be in the hotel. I said, Mr. King, would you come to the U.S. and tell your story? We're doing a big summit. I would like to have you be one of the speakers. Your story needs to be told. Would you come? He said, thanks for the invitation, Rich. Let me check with my intercessors. At which point I said, what? He said, I got intercessors that pray over my business and I don't do anything except I get their permission. I'll call you back in two days. Two days later, he calls me back. Sorry, Rich, I can't come. The intercessors said no. And I'm saying, let me talk to the intercessors. <laughs> Straighten those guys out. No, I really said, why? 
And he said, well, you know, the intercessors reminded me we had a goal of reaching 2,000 of my people for Christ. Only 1,700 of them are saved at this point. Now, only 1,700. Most of us would be thrilled. 1,700 out of 2,000, man, we got victory. He says, my goal was 2,000. They said, Mr. King, you can't go tell your story until all 2,000. Now, I'll send five of my pastors. They'll tell the story. So they came. I said, can I tell your story? He said, you can tell the story, no problem. I can't tell it till I reach my goal, all 2,000. Here's what he was doing. He was establishing the presence of God in houses of prostitution and watching the girls get saved and turning that illegitimate Satan-honoring business into a God-honoring business. Now, I tell that story to business people because a lot of them say, hey, my business is really bad. There's no way this is kingdom business. But most of your businesses aren't as bad as Mr. King's was. And if he can bring his around. Now, I told that story in Hong Kong, and my translator missed the one point. He, he got the girls were saved, but he missed that they stopped being prostitutes. And at the end of that session, I had people ticked off at me. I mean... There were women coming at me with glaring eyes. I said, what did I do? They said, you honored those girls remaining prostitutes after they were Christians. Woo, we need to go back and get the translator to correct that thing. Okay, I want to make sure you all understand it. They got saved and they stopped prostitution. Amen? We got it all. And now they're walking with Jesus. Okay, that's a man who owns his business. Another friend of mine, his name is Arthur Burke. Arthur's a brilliant teacher of the Bible. He has a ministry called Plumline Ministries. This guy's one of the most brilliant uh, students of the Word I've ever met. When I'm talking to him about you can change a business from the inside, he, he's a very matter-of-fact man. Just Here's how matter-of-fact he is. We sent Arthur to Argentina to speak, and we sent with him Ray Jovio to be his interpreter. And Ed Silvoso and I went down about a week later and met up with them. And when we got there, Arthur was preaching in Spanish. And... Uh, we, we said, uh, Ray, did you translate for him? He said, yeah, the first three days I translated for him. And then when the questions started coming, Arthur started answering them in Spanish. And I said, Arthur, do you speak Spanish? He says, oh, yeah, I was, I was raised speaking Spanish. I spoke Spanish for English. We said, Arthur, why didn't you tell us? He said, you never asked. <laughs> so Arthur says, you're going to send a translator with me? Fine, I'll use the translator. So he'd preach in English and be translated, although, okay, so he's a very matter-of-fact guy, all right? <laughs> Arthur's matter-of-fact, straightforward. So he says, I tested your principle. I said, which one? The fact that you can impact a company from inside just by being. I said, what did you do? He said, I laid down my ministry, Plumline Ministries. I went and got a job in my former career as a plumber. I went back to a plumbing company and said, you need a plumber, I'd like to come online. He said, now, I'm the newest plumber there. I haven't worked as a plumber for years, so I'm out of practice, and I'm the lowest paid employee, and I told no one that I was a Christian. He said, a company of eight employees. I just went to work there, but I started praying for the company without telling anybody I'm a Christian. I prayed. I prayed. I prayed. At the end of the first year, the company's profits doubled from the year before. The only difference was I was there, and I hadn't been there the year before. But he said, I'm not bringing that kind of income in because I'm just getting reinstituted as a plumber. The second year, five of the eight employees became Christians by saying to me, Arthur, what's going on? What's happening in your life? Well, let's go have coffee after work hours so that we don't mess with the integrity of the hourly wage the boss is paying us. After work, he said, I led five of them to the Lord. The next year, I think he led all of them or all but one or two of them to the Lord. And by that time, the company's profits had gone up threefold. So he said, I've now tested the principle. I found it to be true. So I went back to my ministry, Plumline Ministries, because I've tested your principle and found it to be true. Now, he didn't test it because of me. He'd done that before I ever met him. But he just saying, you know what? I believe you can impact a company from the inside without ever telling them you're a Christian. I think I'll prove it. Arthur is a very matter-of-fact guy, so he proves it. And I'm saying to you today, if you own the company like Wooden King, you can change it from the inside. If you don't own the company, 
you still have authority because you come as a child of the source behind that company. You come as a child of the King of Kings. So today, you're working at minimum wage simply to put yourself through college. You say, I have no influence there. Yes, you do. You have the influence of God Almighty on your side to make a change in that company, even though you're not going to impact it as the owner. You're going to impact it as the one who knows the source behind the owner. Amen? God is calling you today to fill you with the Spirit for your work, and the purpose for your work is to establish God's presence there so that it can be established throughout Brownsville, Pensacola, Florida, your hometown, your home state, ultimately your home nation, and for the South Africans in our midst, for all of Africa. Amen? Because in South Africa, we don't think city or nation, we think continent. It, that's right, isn't it? You think the whole continent. Amen. So we're going to establish God's presence in that way. Amen? All right, let's stand up. We're going to be done here in uh, just a couple of minutes. Praise the Lord. We're getting out early again today. Man, you're going to love Pastor Rich because he lets you out early. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Now, Father, I ask you today to fill me with the Spirit, with a new understanding of what being filled with the Spirit means. Lord, that I might establish the presence of God, that I would build the ark, not just the one made with hands, but the one that houses your presence. And let that be established in my car and my cubicle, at the counter I work at, the office I'm in, the school I'm a part of, the neighborhood I live in, the mall I work in or shop in, the restaurant I eat in or work in. Let it be established everywhere that coming in touch with me is getting in touch with God. And even getting in touch with the place where I was is getting in touch with God because I'm going to establish your presence and leave it there as a strong Holy Spirit filled Ark of the Covenant, presence of God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We bless you right now in the name of Jesus. We bless you with all spiritual anointings, and I bless you right now with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, and the filling of the Holy Spirit in all kinds of work. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. And uh, you need to, all right, you're dismissed. Praise God.